last week we talked to you about James marrying the concept of faith and works together. And then we ended there uh, and finished with the, the thought of the woman with the issue of blood. And I'd like to briefly recap for just a second the woman with the issue of blood. And uh, we did not finish that. And I would like to finish that today and move into a different area. So if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. You'll remember the scripture from last week. And give me just a few minutes. And I won't stay here very long. I promise you I will move on to something new and different. Amen. Luke chapter 13, verse number 10. Now he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. Y'all better pray because I'm telling you, I feel the Holy Ghost just dropping things off in my spirit, just left and right. And I really want to stick to the message, but I feel something stirring inside of me this morning. There was a certain woman with a spirit of infirmity 18 years, and she was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Just a couple things that I'd like to talk to you about. We touched on last week. The Bible said that Jesus was teaching in the synagogue. Jesus sees her while he's teaching. She can barely stand. The Bible said that she had been stooped over for 18 years with back problems. I asked this question last week, why did she even bother coming? I mean, she had a backache. Why go to church? She'd been doing it for a long period of time, 18 years. This wasn't her first rodeo, and she kept going to church. If I can just meddle a little bit and play with that, I mean, why not just stay home? I mean, God understands when you're frustrated, right? God understands you're not feeling well. God understands she has back problems. Why bother showing up? I'm going to tell you something. That is not God saying that. That is the enemy that does that to the human mind. Why bother showing up? God knows you're ticked off at somebody. Come on, why bother showing up? I think she understands the sowing, that sowing is a process. It's not instant. It is a process. Again, we're talking about sowing and reaping. If I could take that a step further, and I talked about this last week, shame on the church, come on, and the synagogue of the modern day to not be a place where the stooped over can walk in and get healed. Come on, somebody. Amen. Shame on the church that we have become a place that we are so regulated by what people think that people cannot come in church and get healed. Come on. Amen. We can sit in a crowded football game, but we can't come to church and get what we need. Amen. And, and, and listen, what's wrong with the people of God for not expecting something from the God that they love when they walk into the place? Come on. Amen. I mean, he took stripes for our healing. Come on, he was nailed to an old rugged cross, not for the fun of it, not to just see if he could rise again. He did it because he loved us, and he said that the stripes that he took were for our healing, emotional and physical, and I believe there is something wrong with us when we can walk in church, want to sing a couple songs, listen to a three-point message, and not expect anything from the God whose son took stripes on his back for our healing. Shame on us for not being able to sit in church, come on somebody, and expect something out of God other than just some songs and a little bit of word. We can sit in a ball game. It doesn't seem to bother us. We can go to the movies. It doesn't seem to bother us. We can act like married folks when we're single, and it doesn't seem to bother us. Come on. You can run to Texas Roadhouse all weekend, and it doesn't seem to bother you. But my God, go to God's house on Sunday and give him some glory or your praise uh-huh come on go ahead and preach with me amen and listen what's wrong with us that we don't expect anything from God let me say this to you legacy family there is something wrong when people can walk into our church with an infirmity and in bondage and walk out and never receive what they come after now listen it is wrong it is, I, I want to say this I can't make nobody come to an altar I can't make you try to take a step of faith I can't make you lift your hands and worship God but if you do and you don't receive something come 
come on, something's wrong with the people of God. Amen. We need to be able to get what we need from God. Amen. The Bible said she drug herself into that sanctuary. She couldn't stand up for 18 years. Can I just say this to you today? Drag yourself stooped over to church. Come on, drag yourself stooped over to the uh, uh, to the elders of the church. Drag yourself stooped over in front of the body of Christ and be consistent. Listen, and little by little, God is going to move in your situation. Little by little, 18 years it took her, but little by little, God will move in your situation. Luke 13, verse number 14, the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, the leader of the church was mad and because Jesus healed on the Sabbath and he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on one of them and not on the Sabbath day. Can I just preach right here for a second? Look at the religious people. Look at the religious people, the ruler of the synagogue, un, uh, upset because Jesus is completely out of line. How dare he reach down and heal somebody? Come on. How dare he do something that we don't see very often, and he did it without our permission or our help? Come on. Why are they so upset? Why are religious rulers of the synagogue so upset with Jesus in this story? Because he healed on the Sabbath. What an accusation. He healed somebody on the Sabbath. Always remember this. This, religious folks are more concerned about rules than they are people. Mm -hmm. Come on, that's the truth. Let me read this to you. Luke 13, verse 15. He answered and said unto him, hypocrites. Whoo, hallelujah. Amen. Hypocrites, don't each one of you on the Sabbath loose your ox or donkey from the stall? Don't you get that stupid red heifer out of the middle of the highway when she gets out of the fence and lead it away to water when what you want to do is push her in a ditch and run her over? Hallelujah. So, verse 6, sorry, that was just flashed there. 16, so ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. And when he had said these things, all all the adversaries were put to shame and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. All right, now listen, watch this. The woman in this story is praising God and worshiping God. Why? Because for 18 years she had a spirit of infirmity, the word says, and she has been totally just then, totally and completely set free. She has began to thank Jesus and praise him for her healing. Others in the crowd, they begin to thank God and they begin to have church and they they began to praise him as well. Now, pay attention right here. A miracle has just took place in the church, and the leaders of the church are upset because she is there uh, in the uh, she has been there in the past, and that healing has never showed up until Jesus shows up. Boy, do I want to preach right there. You can show up to church all the time, but until Jesus shows up with you, until the Holy Spirit has been loosed in the congregation, come on, you won't get what you came after. Come on are you here today? More than we need big shot titles. More than we need people who have to have an audience to do something. Come on. More than we need flashing lights and smoke filling the sanctuary. We need the presence of God in our midst. We've got enough sissy boys with too tight britches on and shiny shoes behind the pulpit copying sermons off everybody. But give me somebody, a man or a woman, who is laid on their face in their prayer closet and has sought God until tears burnt the side of their face and they've got a word for somebody. I love technology. I'm not against technology. I'd like to have more technology, but I love the Spirit of God more than I like anything else. And technology has never set one person free inside of the church house. Come on, when Smith Wigglesworth was ministering back in the 1800s, they didn't have smoke machines and flashing lights. What they had was the power of the Holy Ghost that was alive and well and people who were willing to do what it took to see God move. I wish to God we'd get some people who'd throw their title on the floor and wipe their feet all over it and they would just get to the place where it doesn't matter what happens with who. I just want to see God move. I want to see people get up out of wheelchairs. You want a church growth program? Let me tell you what will grow a church. You get the power of God moving and people People get healed in your midst and you won't be able to house the people in the church anymore. The religious crowd gets mad. It's crazy what happens when a bad spirit gets in the church. 
Let me preach right here for just a second. It's crazy what happens when a bad spirit gets in the church. It can affect everybody and anybody in the entire place. Jesus recognizes, listen now, the ugly spirit of competition and jealousy, and he begins to rebuke the church leadership. Why? Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Come on. You get that spirit in the church, and it'll tear the place apart. Luke 13, verse number 18. Jesus says this to him now, and i got to slow down. Down and I'm trying to behave. They're mad because he healed somebody on the Sabbath. And now listen to his response to them. So off the wall and so off the cuff, and I hear the Holy Spirit speaking, and I'm trying to move on, but I keep hearing him saying stuff as I read and talk. Listen, he heals, they're mad, and then he just blurts this out. Verse number 18. What is the kingdom of God like? Now listen, when, when I asked my kids a question when they were little, I most of the time already knew the answer. So in the red writing, when Jesus asked the question, I'm pretty confident he knows the answer and he's fixing to teach something. They're mad because he did church different than they wanted and he comes back with this. What is the kingdom of heaven like? They would have been more, uh, more uh, probably more, they would have probably been uh, able to address it better if he would have said something like, what is church like? But you see, ecclesia, the church, that's not even mentioned hardly in the New Testament at all. He preached on the kingdom. Jesus was obsessed with the kingdom teaching. Now listen, so they're mad, and he says, what is the kingdom of God like? And then he said, and, what, and to what shall I compare it? It's like a mustard seed. Oh, my gosh. We're mad, and you're talking about mustard seeds in the kingdom. We're mad. We're mad at you. Don't you understand? And he's smiling at him, going, what's the kingdom of God like? Oh, yeah, it's like a mustard seed. Now, watch this. Which a man took and put in his garden, and it grew and became a large tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. Okay, there are some things that God will release corporately. Come on. Uh, he'll only release corporately, uh, and some things that can't be given and released alone. Now, let me talk to you about this for just a second. I love praise and worship in my devotion time. In my devotion time, I come in here during the week. I sit on the altar. Usually right there is my spot. I like that spot. I don't know why. I just feel more anointed sitting there. I come in here, and that's where I praise and worship, and that's where I talk to God, and I like to do that in my alone time. But listen to me. I can praise a whole lot better when there's a whole lot of people around. Come on. There's something different about a corporate anointing. I like to praise when I'm with y'all. Worship is easier when I'm with everybody. Why? Because together, the Bible teaches us that we are, we are the body of Christ. Come on. Can the eye say to the ear that I don't need you? I, see, I heard somebody say just a second ago, well, I can praise just as good by myself. Well, then go on with your happy self and do that. You don't need a church, do you? Amen. Because we, together, we, that is not singular, we, are the body of Christ. Can the eye say to the ear, I don't need you? Or can the ear say to the eyes that I don't need you? If everybody was an eye in the kingdom, where would the hearing come from? How would you hear from God? So here's what Jesus is teaching us, that there are people with different gifts that will add to and complement what you have in your life, and you will be able to hear him better when you are in a corporate anointing. Now let me say this to you this morning, that there are times uh, blessings are uh, are connected and linked to other people. When God's people, the Bible said, are in one mind and one accord, come on, there are things that are linked to other people. So 18 years she was bent over and Jesus let them, uh, uh, Jesus says, let me tell you what the kingdom of God is like. He said, it's like a mustard seed that gets planted and it keeps going to the synagogue for 18 years. Little by little, it begins to grow. It's not very big. It's just a little thing. And then after a little while, it's this big. And after a little while, it's this big. And after a little while, it's this big. And after 18 years of worship, it's so big that now the birds can find a place to nest in it and there is shade underneath of it. What he's saying is if you will be consistent, 
Come on, somebody. Amen. It's big enough, in fact, to provide shade and safety for the birds to nest in. And here's what he's telling them. He was telling them her healing was a process that started out little and turned into something big. This wasn't her first rodeo, and it wasn't her first time praising that day that Jesus saw her in the synagogue. Do you know why we have to go through the process of life? Do you understand why? It's so hypocrites can't walk in and get in one day what you've been praying 10 years for. Come on, amen. We live in an instant feel-good society where it seems like the majority feel entitled to anything and everything. I love banana pudding. Amen. I just felt the Holy Ghost sweep right through here when I said that. Banana pudding. Anybody else feel it? Amen. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I love banana pudding. It's one of the best things in the world, I think. Amen. But I love it best when it's not out of a jello box. That's okay when it's quick and you got to do something quick and you didn't know company was coming and you throwing something together with a jello box and you cut up some half rotted bananas and throw in there to hide them anyways that you was saving for banana bread. Come on. Amen. Uh, but I like the homemade bake kind. Amen. I like it when it's got that crispy crust on top of it. Amen. That just tastes real good. Makes that little thing in the back of your throat start to wiggle when you eat it. Amen. I love it. Listen, in every area of your life, you don't get the good stuff unless you're willing to invest some time in it. If you want jello box blessings, that's fine. But if you want the good stuff, you're going to have to invest some time. Come on, amen. They criticized her for what happened that day because it didn't happen on the Sabbath. But what happened that day didn't start that day. It just ended on that day. That wasn't the first time that she had invested her Sabbath in worship. She started 18 years earlier is what the word said. And because of her bent over praise that continued and was consistent at day after after day and week after week and month after month and year after year. Come on, somebody. And year after year, one day, while at church, her infirmity couldn't hold her praise any longer. Why? Because the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Come on, somebody. Amen. That little by little, it continuously keeps growing. If you've been praying, you hear me. If you've been praying for something for a couple weeks and God hadn't moved just yet, hang on. Be consistent. Come on. Come on, somebody. Hang on and be consistent. I promise you the God that loves you will take care of you in due season if you faint not. I'm getting breakthroughs today in 2000. 2022 that I began praying about in 2009 when I first came here. Amen. I'm blessed today because my mom and daddy taught me when I was mowing grass up and down the street at 13 and 12 years old uh, for the neighbors. My daddy taught me that 50 cents of that $5. Come on, now it takes $5 for one tank of gas. Come on, amen. It takes you $55 a week to mow the church lawn. Isn't that crazy? Amen. $400. Anyway, uh, my daddy told me $5. He said 50 cents of that goes to Jesus, son. If you want to be blessed, that's what goes on. And I'm being blessed today because of what my parents taught me when I was a kid. Now that I'm older, I have been a consistent giver. Come on and listen, I dare you to say it. Poverty will not hold me back. That spirit of poverty doesn't hold me back. You can... Oh and preach right here. I just want to, oh, Lord, I feel the ugly spirit coming on. I don't even know if I'm mad, happy, or just feel God. Amen. But listen, you can make up every excuse why you can't and why this happened and why that happened, but if you'll just start sowing little by little, I'm telling you, little by little, God will start moving for you. Poverty doesn't hold me back today because, listen, most of our breakthroughs in our life don't start today. They started years ago. And what God starts one way, he usually will not end the same way. I feel something just messing with me. I got to hurry and get done so I can preach. What in the world did he just say? You heard me. All right. Who's the Lord of your harvest? Who's the Lord of your harvest? Who's the Lord of your seed? Let me just ask this real quick. i got to stick to the subject. We'll shout in just a minute. Okay? Who's the Lord of your seed? If it's the stock market, you're in trouble. Mm-hmm. 
it's the Republicans, you're in trouble. And if it's the Democrats, you're in trouble. Come on, somebody. Amen. You're in trouble if that's what you're counting on. I have heavily invested in some things over the years. And I'm going to tell you, six months ago, Brother Ed Lane and I were talking about this the other day. Six months ago, we were counting our money. Woo-hoo! I've been invested for years in some things and going, hmm, hmm, yeah, I need to cash out now. Look at what God is doing. Hallelujah. And guess what happened? I should have cashed out. Amen. We'd paid this church off already. Amen. Who is the Lord of your seed? Who is the Lord of your harvest? Now, hang in there with me for just a second. I'm going to say some tough things right here, okay? God is Lord of our harvest in our lives. Hear me again. God is the Lord of the harvest in our lives, but listen carefully. He will bring a harvest into our lives depending on how you sow. Now, hang on. You and I, let me say this again. God is the Lord of the harvest, but you and I are Lord of the seed. Are you hearing me? Come on, pay attention. Pay attention. God is the Lord of the harvest in our life, but we are the Lord of our seed. Look at your neighbor and tell him, we are the Lord of our seed. If you don't believe it, just hang on. You don't even have to repeat it. Because I understand that he is that I am the Lord of the seed, we need to be careful that we don't put God in a box and tell him how to run his business. Because if I am the Lord of the seed that I plant and he is the Lord of the harvest, my harvest depends on my seed. Right? Okay, hang on. You might be married to the sorriest spouse in the state of Texas. Come on, and tell God, you've got two more weeks, and that's all I can take. Two more weeks of this sorry joker. Two more weeks of this lazy woman. That's all I can take. you got to change her, or you got to change him. Well, what if God wants three weeks? Come on. Come on. We, when we put God in a box, we in essence are making ourselves the Lord of the harvest, not just the Lord of the seed. You'll see where I'm going, okay? Now listen, it's up to us if we put seed in the ground. I, I have to stop shouting for a minute. I need, to, I need you to get this. There are some in here that have been let down so bad. There are some in here who feel like God has forgotten all your prayers over the years and your sacrifices that you have made. Now listen, you cannot allow things that didn't turn out well in the past to dictate your future. That's called being victimized or having victim thinking. Man, do I know some people who need to hear this today. I hope they snoop on uh, on uh, uh, YouTube and listen. Come on, amen. Victim thinking, victim speaking. It happens to the best Christians, a place where bad seasons cause us to lose focus. We can't allow an event in our life to become or dictate our lifestyle in the future. You have heard this said, I'm sure, many times, but we can't and we must refuse to live in victim mentalities. Come on, amen. Hold on, I got somewhere I'm going. You see, this is the way the enemy works. The enemy wants you to have an event in your life when you were seven, eight, nine years old, when you are 14, 15, or 18, or whatever age you were. So then when you're 45 and 50 years old, you're still living in that cycle or that season of your life. Mm -hmm. You had a bad marriage. And then you wind up getting divorced. And then you remarry and the same trouble starts happening again in that marriage. Why? Because many times we still live in what happened in that previous relationship. No trust. Always suspicious. Come on. Your seeds cause cycles in life. Mm -hmm. Let me go a step further and tell you what those cycles are like most of the time. They usually cause a person to live in depression. They usually cause a a person to live defeated or oppressed and feel like it's always going to be this way and it will never get better. Well, pastor, 
I was legitimately hurt. Listen, I understand legitimate hurts. But if we don't get a hold of the cycle, it's going to start a downward spiral in our life, that way of living the victim way. It teaches people not to expect too much out of you because you were hurt 35 years ago. Come on. Because I was hurt at the last church, I'm not going to do anything in this church. Because the last spouse let me down, I'm not going to do anything with this one. Because the last one did this, I'm going to keep a separate bank account. We're not going to ever really become one. Because this happened to me, and this, this ha- and, and that happened, I'm not even going to marry that one. I'm just going to shack up. Did he say that? Yes, I did. Amen. That's victim living. And listen, it's not God's will for our life. Let me tell you what victim living and thinking will do. You'll begin to reap victim thinkers all around you in your life. You will attract negative people in your life. Listen to me. We are the Lord. uh, uh, God is the Lord of the harvest, and we are the Lord of our seed. And depending on what you sow, we can reap. Come on. We can reap some not so desirable things in our life. Look at your neighbor and tell them, be careful what you sow. Be careful what you sow. Come on, tell them, be careful what you sow. All right? Got one more point. Aren't you glad? I said something I hadn't said in a long time. Shacking. I said it. Uh Uh-huh. Just because the guy down the road don't say it doesn't mean it's not in the Bible. It means he don't have a spine. I had a guy in the gym a few weeks ago say to me, Preacher, you look like you're starting to get back in shape a little bit, and you look like you're starting to feel good. I said, Really? I said, What makes you think I'm starting to feel good? He said, Dude, when you first came in here, you were like barely moving. He said, I was glad to see you back, but now you're sweating and moving. And I was like, Yeah, it's starting to feel good again, getting back in my routines. I got out of my routine when we were starting that daycare, and Kevin and I worked for two years back there. Uh, and then we get it set, and then we did it again, and then we get it set, we did it again, and then we get it set, we did it the fourth time, and then hopefully we don't have to do it again. But I got out of my routine. And I told him, Yeah, yeah, I have more energy. I'm feeling sore, but it's that good sore. It's that good sore where you can't even brush your teeth because your arms hurt so bad. I mean, it's that good sore. And he said, remember this, Pastor. Now, this is what he said. He said this this last week to me because this would have been the end of this message. But because of what he said, Holy Spirit started talking, and I had to get another point. He said, remember this, Pastor. I'm going to get him to come here and preach too. This guy was shot in the head, shot in the side, lost his pituitary gland, has lost his liver, lost a point of, uh, part of his lung, and uh, he went to jail. He got caught in a, he robbed his drug dealer. Can you believe that? He robbed his drug dealer. It's crazy stuff. And he got shot in the middle of it, and then he went to prison for two years, and while he was in prison hating God, he was laying in his floor, and he said, I might as well just start singing worship song. He got filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen. Now he's preaching all over the place. Amen. It's, a, it's crazy. So anyways, uh, he said this to me in the gym this last week. He said, preacher, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. And I said, okay. And he goes, no, listen to me. This is a word for you. All right. He said, a body in motion stays in motion. Man, when he said that, when he said that, I said, yeah, 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 I get it. I get it, I get it, I get it. Yeah, 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 I get it, I get it, I get it. Um, he was talking physically, but instantly when he said it, I knew exactly what the Holy Spirit was speaking, and I'm standing there pouring sweat, standing in my sweatpants, smelling like a monkey, and Holy Spirit started to speak to me, and he said, a spirit in motion stays in motion. Come on, a body, a spirit in motion stays in motion. So I heard the Holy Spirit say to me in that moment that while reaping works in cycles, sowing must be continuous. Man, do I want to preach right here. Give me just a second. Do you realize that if you line up a life of sowing that you can control the reaping process in your life? Come on. Let me say that again. Do you realize that if you line up your life where you are constantly sowing, that you can control the reaping process and the cycles of your life in almost every area? Let me explain it to you, okay? Hold on, watch this. Listen to this parable Jesus spoke in Matthew 13, 24. 
The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, a crop then the tares also appeared. So the, servant, uh, so the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How is it then that you have tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us to go and get and gather them up? And he said, No, lest while you gather up all the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. I need to preach right here. I need to preach right here. God help me. God help me. God, let me say this right. All right, so if I sow continuously, I understand the process of sowing and reaping. I understand that if I sow apples, I'm going to get apples back. But if I sow apples and then I turn around and sow the next day oranges, I'll reap apples, but then I will also reap oranges. So if I sow apples one day, oranges the next day, and bananas the next day, I know I'm going to reap apples and there will come another time where in the same amount of time I'm going to reap the oranges and while I'm reaping oranges I've got something else about ready to produce fruit and I'm walking over to there. So what I'm saying to you is depending on how you sow and how you line up your seed, you could literally live a life of reaping continuously. The master went out and sowed wheat in his field and his servants came to him and said, there's tares in that field. Do you want us to go get those tares out? And the master said, an enemy has done this, but leave them there. Because if you pull the tear, you're going to hurt the wheat. Oh, boy, can I preach right here for just a second. Listen, anytime somebody talks to you about your church, I pray these scriptures pop into your head. I pray these scriptures pop into your head every time somebody talks about your church to you. Anytime somebody tries to get you to leave your church because they got their nighty in a knot. Come on, I pray right now that these scriptures pop in your head. These people are tares. Tares want to get good people caught up in things they don't need to hear and things that just quite honestly have nothing to do with them. Tares go home and say things like, I just don't know about that pastor and leadership at Legacy Church. Can I say this to you? Don't let people poison you. Come on. Don't let people badmouth to you. Don't let people badmouth your church and its leadership. If you are best friends with somebody, don't let people bad mouth and poison you towards the person sitting on the seat next to you. Come on, somebody. Are you in here? Come on. Are you here? Come on. Are you here today? Most of the time people like to talk trash and talk smack is because they don't even like themselves. So in turn, the way to take the focus off of themselves is to put the focus on other people. Come on, somebody. Are you here today? Yeah. Man, I just feel like I'm just being plumb mean. I felt like this at a funeral just a couple days ago. Something was said, just made me crawl up and down all up and got me all kinds of twisted up and I had to get up and correct some things. Just getting all kinds of frustrated here. I don't know, this might be the Holy Ghost. I don't know. Amen. Matthew 6, uh, 13, verse number 29. Watch this. I'm getting ready to close. Don't make me sound too good yet. Hold on. You play Corinth Brown and it's going to be over, okay? So just be careful. He said, no, you don't tear those wheats up uh, or tear, uh, take the tares out because if you do, you're going to uh, uproot the wheat with them. Verse 30, so let them both grow together until harvest. And at that time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather the tare and bind them and bundle them and burn them, and then gather the wheat and put it in my barn. Okay, hey, Jesus, do you want us to get rid of the tares in that field? No. No. Why? Okay, now listen carefully here. Because everything works in cycles. Come on. I'm hoping you're catching this. Everything works in cycles. We have to let them grow together for a season. But there will come a time or a season, come on, when the separating process will take place. God doesn't need our help with the separating process. He said we're going to leave them alone for a time and let them grow. But there will come a time and there will come a season 
where the separating will take place. He said, you're going to take the good stuff and put it in the barn, and the other ones, you're going to tie all that negativity together, and you're going to burn it. Now, hang on. Listen carefully. I'm fixing to help somebody, okay? Have you ever wondered why it seems that God sends a person into your life and they become somebody you can lean on and depend on and they are so helpful to you and then all of a sudden for no apparent reason something happens and they're gone out of your life? Amen. There are some seasons when God will send people to you and then when that season is over, he will move them on or he may move you on. Listen, nothing stays the same forever. Look at your graduation picture and then look in the mirror. I've seen some pictures on some of y'all's walls where you had hair. Nothing. Come on, look at your neighbor. Tell him, nothing stays the same forever. Yeah, it doesn't matter how many. Oh, God, you don't want me to say that, Lord Jesus. Amen. That would just pure be mean right there. Amen. All right, so uh, he'll move them on because nothing stays the uh, That was just a mean thought right there. Nothing stays the same forever. Life is a continuous cycle of perpetual motion. I feel like I might need to say this for somebody in here today. Quit spending your days and weeks and months and years trying to hang on to what God has moved on. Don't spend weeks mourning over a loss or you may miss the entrance of your next season which will be 10 times better than where you came from. Come on, you keep living in the past and you'll never get to the future. You hang on to that other relationship, God will never bring the new one into you. Come on, somebody. You live in the past and dwell in the past forever and you will never see the new that God has for you. Oh, where have you been all service? You're making me feel good right now. Come on, amen. You will miss what God has for you if you continually live in the past. I'm reading a book right now, and here's what, it, here's what the title says. It says, what got you here won't get you there. Mm-hmm. Come on, amen. What got you here won't get you there. You see, it's very simple. I'm fixing to close. That's my second one. Hold on. It's very simple. Our bodies work off cycles. You can Google this and find this to be true. Every seven to ten years with the right vitamins and the right minerals, our body will heal itself, and it can even reproduce dead tissue. You can find that. That's a, that's a, that's a, a medical fact, okay? There is also only a few days a month that a woman can conceive. Why? Because God created a female's body to work off of cycles. Come on, amen? Are you here? It rains. And when it rains, the atmosphere soaks it up, and then it rains again. Listen, droughts occur. Droughts occur when cycles become unbalanced. Come on, I want to say this to you. If God tells you to shout, you better throw down and shout. If God tells you to run or dance, you better throw down and run and dance. Mike, where are you, Mike Warner? Where are you in here, Mike Warner? I watched you this morning go to two different people, and God was giving you specific words, and I knew they were from God because when you left, the people were bent over, and they were bawling their eyes out. When God tells you to give somebody a word, give them a word. When God tells you to run and dance, run and dance. Come on. If God tells you to just bow your head and shed a tear, my God, you better take your happy self and start shedding a tear. Why? So your spiritual cycle doesn't get unbalanced. God may speak to you to give. Amen. He may speak to you to testify. He may direct you to speak to somebody specifically, Brother Mike. Listen, if you want to live in a life of perpetual blessing, don't miss your cycle and become unbalanced. Last thing, and I'll stop here. Third closing. I just usually type up about 20 pages of notes, and wherever I feel led to stop, I usually just quit and continue the next week. Apple seeds do not produce orange trees. Matthew 13, verse 26, when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. The servant's owner came and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in the field? How is it that you have tares in there? You sow good seed and you have tares. Apples don't produce oranges, right? Right? Come on, somebody. The servant says to the owner, didn't you sow good seed? He says, yeah, I did. And he said, well, what's all this junk in here? What's all this junk? 
Okay, now this is going to be a little bit difficult, so hang on for a second here. In our lives, when we see something popping up that's not very attractive, the first thing we need to do is take inventory of what we're planning. But usually the first thing that happens in the church with Christians and it's the first thing and usually the easiest thing to do is we start rebuking the devil and binding bad spirits. I rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I bind that devil. Man, you can rebuke and bind and cast out and stomp your feet and cut yourself just like they did in the Word. But listen, what we really need to do first is ask ourselves a very honest question, and that is, is this what I sowed? Now, this is going to be kind of rough, and it's going to sound kind of harsh, but listen, when you say things, when you see things popping up and you didn't expect it, it's not the time to start speaking in tongues and prophesying. You need to ask yourself, did I sow that seed? The bank calls and says, bring your car in or we're going to come get it. That is not the time to start shouting, prophesying, speaking in tongues, and binding the devil. Come on. If you don't make the payments, they're going to take the car. Right? Come on, amen. Did I sow apples expecting oranges? You go to the ATM machine and that little devil in there, you want to get $20 out to get you a Big Mac or something. And that little devil says when you type your little number in, balance, negative $140. It's not time to bind the enemy at the AT. I bind that devil in that machine right now. In that neighbor. I speak life over this wallet. Give me the oil. Give me the oil. Woo, hallelujah. No, no, no. Listen, it's not time to do all that. It's not time to do all that. How did this happen? I'll tell you how it happened. Wendy's, Little Caesars, Nancy's Nail Salon, Wilma's Weave Hut. Come on. Yeah. Not tithing. Not tithing. Yeah, that's how it happened. I sowed apples and expected oranges. Mm -hmm. Galatians 6 and 7. Paul said this, don't be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Well, I asked the Lord to forgive me. It doesn't matter if you ask the Lord to forgive you. You're still going to reap. It's a spiritual principle. It just means when you ask the Lord to forgive you, he'll give you the grace to go through the reaping process. But if you sowed it, you're going to reap it. Come on, somebody. We either believe all of it or we need to take the Bible, throw it away, and walk away from it. Come on, amen. We can't be hypocritical about the way we do this, right? If you sow apples, you're going to get apples. If you sow pears, you're going to get pears. Come on. You can't sow apples and get pears and peaches and bananas and oranges. You're going to get an apple. It's funny, but yet it's not funny to me when people get so upset because they say, somebody was cold to me. Man, they treated me cold today at church. They was rude. I don't know what was going on. They treated me cold. I don't like that. People act that way in church. They treated me cold, and they were critical and bitter and ugly. You know, they, they were, they, well, it's always funny to me when people say that when everywhere they go, they're cold, critical, bitter, and ugly to everybody else. Come on. Preacher, I'm not that way. Then why do people hide when they see you coming down the aisle? When you're at work, why do they go in the other room real quick? When you're at home, why do the kids run when you walk in? Come on, somebody. Amen. It's usually not because you're nice, friendly, sweet, and loving. Pastor, I don't have any real friends. I feel I'm, I'm just now getting a little older and I'm starting. I don't even have any real friends. Are you friendly? The Bible says show yourself. Friend. Come on. Are you friendly? Pastor, nobody will give me a break in this life. Do you ever have any mercy or grace in your heart for other people? Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It will be put into your bosom. And for that same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. We use this scripture for offering. Well, I want to tell you something. That scripture, if you put it in context, has absolutely nothing to do with money given. It will be given. Jesus is talking about people who have unforgiveness in their heart. I don't know why I won't give. Nobody will forgive me. Because he said, if you give forgiveness, it will be given to you. 
This had nothing to do with money. The principle's the same, but it had nothing to do with money. Come on, somebody. So listen, if you're going through junk and I'm going through junk, junk, we don't need to automatically start binding and rebuking. We need to ask ourselves, did I sell for this? Am I having problems in my family? Listen now, because behind closed doors, I talk about everybody else's family. It just got quiet in this Presbyterian church. You need to go from scowling to smiling. That's why they make makeup. So when your face breaks, you can patch it all back up. And if you're a little bit older and Maybelline don't work, get you some Bondo. They got it at Pep Boys and O'Reilly's. Come on, somebody. You want a blessing? Quit being a taker and start blessing other people. Come on. You want people to be sweet? Give them a donut. No, I'm just kidding. I looked right at you and that popped in my mind. You want people to be sweet? Quit being ugly to everybody. Come on. You want people to be tender hearted? Quit being so harsh. You want people to be merciful? Quit being so judgmental. Nobody ever blesses me, Pastor. Who do you bless? I gotta quit. I gotta quit. Come on, stand with me. I'll stop right here. Sowing and reaping. You can line up blessings in your life if you sow properly. If you sow properly, you can line blessings up in your life. Everything you told me to do today, I ask you to touch your people in this place. In Jesus' name, let me say this real quick, and then we're gonna we're gonna do some things. But let me say this real quick to you and ask you a couple questions. Are you reaping some things that you wish you hadn't reaped? reaping some things that you wish weren't coming your way. Well, I don't know why this is happening. I don't know why they're upset. Have you reaped that? I said something to somebody the other day. They were upset about something and they said something to me and they said, well, those people, and I said, wait a minute, hold on, hold on. I said, I feel like the older I get, the wiser I'm getting. <laughs> Listen, we talk about their family, people are going to talk about ours. You need to leave that alone. They're not our family. You can't change anything, and you don't have no say-so in anything they do. Leave their family to them and leave me alone. I don't want to hear it. So if I have something bad to say about you, and I start telling it over here, I shouldn't be shocked when something starts coming to me because I brought that on myself, sowing and reaping. If Bob wants to come up and tell me something, I really just don't care anything you have to say. It just really doesn't matter to me what you say. I know who I am. I don't need anything from you. I got my thing figured out. We all good over here, baby. I'm good. Got it going on. You know, I don't know why I can't hear from God anymore. 
God just tried to tell you something and you wouldn't listen. And depending on how you line your seed up, come on, you can reap some good stuff. So I start out on Monday and I start blessing it. Hey, I won't take you to lunch today. Seriously. Tomorrow, you want to do lunch? Noon. All right. Got a meeting with a roofer at 10. I'll be back and I'll be hungry by noon. And, and I'm going to tell you something, Brother Paul. We are going to see God move in this situation you and I have been working on. We're going to see God move where he's going to bless us. We're just going to sow good seed and not to leave Sister Linda because she's so blessed already being married to Brother Ed. But, uh, you know, I'm just going to keep blessing her and blessing her. And, Kevin, you and I are going to, we're going to get, get a dinner on Tuesday. We're going to do it because we're hungry. Amen. And I know I'm going to be. I'm telling you, you're a good fella, and I'm just going to keep on every day. And you guess what happened? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. We, what I'm doing, I'm lining up my seed, and I just keep getting blessed every day. Every day, because I keep sowing, God keeps blessing me. Can I tell you something that I felt like telling you, and then your grandma grabs somebody else? Stretch your hands right here a minute in the thing. I line up and I may not get it all at one time but if I sow now in 10 years I'm going to be reaping what I've been sowing you and I talked this week Tracy or maybe it was last week we talked and you're in kind of a similar thing that you're doing with Ed and I and this other uh, brother uh, what's your name yeah uh, brother Kent over here I knew his name I just forgot it and, and, and what happens, we sow now, and then a few years from now, what happens is we start reaping because we sow. And if you keep laying those seeds out, God will bless you. But the same works in the opposite. If you lay out ugly, and you lay out lies, and you lay out meanness, you're going to continually reap ugly and meanness and lies and it just is perpetual motion. It never stops. Here's what I want us to do today. God has given some of you a word for somebody in here today. And before we leave here today, here's what I want you to do. I can lay hands on every person in here and be here all day long. But it works better when we do this corporately because the preacher is not your source. God is your source, and the source may come through somebody sitting in here that God is speaking to. So I want you to exercise the gifts that you have, and I want you to lay your hands on somebody, or if the Lord has spoke to you, to give somebody specific a word. I'm not against prophecy. Come on, not against prophecy. I want you to go give them a word, and then I have something we're going to end with that somebody else has got a corporate anointing. Come on, take a minute. Lay your hands on somebody. Walk around the room if you need to for a minute. Come on. Come on. Come on, take just a few minutes. Come on, it's okay. It's okay. God is speaking to you. It's okay.
as if it was over you made a way and we're standing here only because you this real quick. Brother Bob asked me before service started, he said, I feel like God has given me a word whenever you have time for it. And, uh, Brother Bob, I appreciate you doing that. Uh, come on up here a minute. I believe God spoke to you. He has something for us to hear. You know, while I was in praise and worship, uh, God gave me three letters, and I understood them perfectly. He said M-W-O. Now, I was in the military for six years. And any time we went to the field, we carried 56 10-wheel trucks and trailers to move all our stuff. So when the military would get ready to move, they would give us an MWO, which is a movement warning order. It said, prepare. I'm about to move. Get ready. Pack up your stuff. Get rid of the junk you don't need. It's time to move on. God told me to tell this church that he's giving you an MWO. He said, there's a movement warning order coming. He said, there's a movement of the Lord coming to this church. And he said, it's time to pack up the stuff you don't need. The bitterness, the anger, the fear, the relationships, the broken problems, the depression, the anxiety, the worry. He said, it's time to pack it up, throw it down. You don't have time for it. You don't have the ability to carry it because of what God has for you to do. You and your wife, chunk it, chunk it all, chunk it all. He said, I got things for you to do, buddy. He said, I got a movement for you that you cannot imagine. I've got a ministry for you that you don't even know about, that you can't figure out, that you can't make happen. He said, I'm going to make it happen. He said, I'm going to make it happen. He said, it's not about what's up here, it's about what's in here. And he's about to change your life in a way that you cannot understand. You, he said, get rid of the fear. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to be afraid of. God said, I'm not done with you. I just got started with you. I brought you through the fire and you're gonna bring others through the fire. And he said, you're gonna understand signs, wonders and miracles. He said, dump it, get rid of it, it's over. Leave it where you found it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, brother. He said, you got some guns, right? But he's giving you spiritual guns. He's, I, don't, I don't know you. I, I, I haven't seen you very much, but I'm going to tell you something. God's got something amazing for you to do. There's some junk in the past and stuff that you need to leave behind. There's some relationships you need to leave behind. There's some things in the world that you need to leave behind because he said, I'm ready to move. And he said, I need to move through you. I want to use you. He said, as strong as you are physically, he said, I want to make you that strong spiritually. He said, I'm ready to move in you. He said, I need you to listen to me. Because when you do, he said, I'm going to start using you in a way you do not understand. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 And God's not through with you guys yet. Right? He's not through with you guys. He's just getting started. And here's the question he says, do you trust me? Here's some hard things for you to do. Do you trust me? Here's some hard things for you to do. Right? You've been through hard times. I don't know very many people have been through more hard times than you have. But he said, i got some harder things for you to do. And the reason I'm giving them to you to do is because you know how to deal with hard things. He said, you've never given up on me. You've always trusted me. Don't stop trusting me now. Don't look at the world. Don't look at circumstances and situations. Look at God. Look at God. Look what he can do. Where's that young man that was up here praying earlier this morning? Come here, brother. such an anointing for you, brother. There is a young generation out there waiting for you. Waiting for you. And all you have to do is continue to connect with Him. Don't worry about whether you know all the Word or not. Don't worry about whether you're young or not. Uh, Timothy, Paul told Timothy, he said, don't worry about your age. Don't 
Don't worry about whether you're young or old. You've got a heart for God. You just keep going what you got, man. You just keep going with what you got because God is going to use you in an amazing, miraculous way. Amen? Amen. Where's your daughter at? Get her out of the foyer. I need to talk to her. Where is she at? Where is she at? God gave you that hair for no reason. Fire, 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 fire. God said, you're going to be fire. You're going back. He said, babe, I'm just getting cranked up with you. He said, I've got situations and circumstances I'm going to put you in that is going to take you to a new level with me that you've never been before. He said, it's no coincidence I put you where you're at. Gave you the roommate I gave you. No coincidence. He said, I got something for you. And it's fire. You get with God. You just get with God. You pray. You pray in tongues. You begin to believe. God's going to do something incredible in Germany. He's going to do something incredible. And he's going to use you as his instrument. Don't take, don't take the glory. Don't take the gold. Just give him all the credit. Watch what he's going to do in your life.